My name is Asad Zedi. I'm uh, in the second year of my PhD at the Institute for Global Health and also at the MRC uh, Clinical Trials Unit. Um, and I'm also a visiting scholar at the National University of Medical Sciences in, in, in Pakistan. Um, and so my background's uh, in clinical medicine and uh, sort of TB nonprofit work. Um, and I'm funded through the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. So I'm also here as a sort of visitor experiencing what uh, life in the UK is like. And I explored some of that last night as well. So, um, so which is great to see. Um, right, so um, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the ICE-TB framework. Uh, and apologies to some of you if you've heard this before already. It'll be a bit of a repetition of the slides I've presented before, but there is some updated content just uh, uh, just for this uh, this meeting that I've prepared. So uh, hopefully I'll update on that as well. Um, so, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah, so before I begin, yeah, I just want to say this was like a really large effort to put all of this together. Um, so especially want to thank uh, everybody here and also Hanif who hopefully will be uh, joining later today. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I want to thank all of these people and, and the funders as well. Many of you uh, already know. Um, okay, so uh, thinking through uh, how TB has sort of been classified, and this is what we were taught in med school or in public health school and so on, uh, that TB is a binary disease, essentially, that there's a latent phase and then there's an active phase. Um, and in the active phase, you sort of have the typical symptoms of TB, such as cough, fever, night sweats, etc. Um, your chest x-ray is abnormal and you test positive for different tests uh, related to TB. Uh, and then on the other side, you have latent TB. And in latent TB, uh, the idea is that you don't have any symptoms. Your chest x-ray is normal. You're not thought to be contagious and you test negative on your, you know, all your conventional tests for, for TB. Uh, and, and you test positive on, on these blood tests. So uh, there's evidence to suggest uh, that, you know, this conventional paradigm no longer works or we, we need to rethink this. Um, and I'll sort of break down some of these reasons for you briefly um, over here. So the first is actually the diagnosis of, you know, quote unquote latent TB. And generally speaking, uh, you know, coming from, from the public health program side, this means a positive IGRA or a TST. Um, but we know that this is a test of human response and doesn't really check the presence of actual bacilli. So what it means is, practically speaking, it has low positive predictive value. And when you plug it into a program, you have a lot of people who are being treated for latent TB that won't actually end up uh, going to develop TB disease. Um, and this is still the convention. You can see it's uh, on the CDC website as well at the moment. Uh, so why do we think this no longer works? Well, so the first reason, and this is sort of building on Hanif's PhD, uh, and some of you might be familiar with this, is where they sort of looked at uh, asymptomatic contacts of drug resistant TB patients. These individuals didn't have any symptoms. They were bacteriologically negative, but they had several of these sort of active dynamic lesions on PET-CT imaging, uh, which you can sort of see here. And these sort of progressed over time, some of them regressed and some of them uh, went, went further as ahead. And when these individuals were followed over time, around half of them ended up developing active TB. Uh, and compared to the control cohort in which they didn't have any lesions and nobody developed active TB. This suggests that there isn't an instantaneous process of moving from latent to active. There's a sort of a pathway that patients generally take. Um, another paper most of you are probably familiar with is sort of this meta-analysis looking at uh, uh, prevalence surveys. Uh, I think in total 23 were looked at in African and Asian settings and around half of those individuals uh, who were diagnosed with bacteriologically positive TB didn't report any symptoms within this uh, within the survey. So, you know, people don't go from no symptoms to symptoms immediately. There's a, there's a phase in which they might be bacteriologically positive as well. Um, and sort of the mechanism of this, I think we have a better understanding now is generally sort of an aerosol based uh, sort of transmission model. So uh, in this sort of uh, sort of experimental chamber, uh, they had they placed individuals that had uh, uh, that had MTB that were MTB positive as well as MTB negative, and they sort of just breathe sort of the title breathing within the chamber uh, and TB was detected amongst both set of courts and it was detected among uh, people who were visiting the clinics as well. So otherwise healthy individuals. Um, and then on the right, uh, uh, many of you are aware of this sort of this experimental sample collection tool developed by the group at Leicester, in which again, you put on this face mask in a, in a clinic setting uh, and the patients are allowed to breathe into it and they were able to detect uh, aerosols uh, or able to detect uh, MTB uh, through aerosols, so no need for cough as well here. So this suggests that there is a sort of a transmission pattern as well uh, in the earlier stages of TB. So all of this sort of evidence uh, sort of emerged from this. Um, uh, the, the first paper that made people rethink was this one by Clifton Barry in, uh, at the NIH uh, back in 2009. Uh, and this group suggested that we need to rethink this current classification of latent and active, and there's potentially a spectrum of disease states 
uh, that that happened uh, in, in, within this process, and and they gave sort of different uh, criteria for those. Now, since that paper was published, there were several uh, different review articles um, and and you know commentaries on how we need to rethink uh, the sort of the late and active paradigm, and several new sort of frameworks were proposed. Um, so that brings us to the sort of the ICTB uh, sort of uh, framework, and the goal, our goal here was quite simple. It was to propose and then to reach consensus on a novel set of classification system for, for TB. And we did this through a three-step process, and I'll walk you through each one of those. Um, so the first one was a scoping review, and here our aim was to see how has TB been described as a multi-stage disease in literature. Um, so we did a systematic search for terms related to TB and TB stage, spectrum, uh, framework, classification, etc. Uh, and here we basically excluded articles that weren't describing explicitly TB as a multi-stage disease, so really uh, as, a, as a binary disease, so really looking at a multi-stage sort of framework. Uh, and we looked, we included 40 articles in the, in the final analysis. Um, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that TB is no longer binary, but there's actually 27 distinct stages for TB that have been described in the literature. Um, now, clearly 27 was too many, so we tried to ca categorize these around common themes. So we found eight common themes around how we group these. Um, and basically, these sort of trace the uh, sort of the pathogenesis of the disease process. So, starting from the elimination of the disease, to control of the infection, to breakdown of control, development of symptoms, uh, and bacteriologically positive disease, and and increased severity of disease. But when we were looking at the terminology and the use of which uh, how these states have been described, it really varies. So, each each framework or each paper was using a different kind of terminology, and the frequency with which they were using these states also differed. So as an example, if you're an immunologist uh, or the papers that were focusing on sort of immunology were more interested in the earlier stages around disease elimination or control of the infection. Uh, if you were an epidemiologist, they were more interested in sort of when when does, when is someone symptomatic versus when are they transmitting the disease when they're bacteriologically positive and clinicians were more interested in sort of, you know, the severity of the disease and so on. Uh, so really the perspective that the articles were taking were based on sort of their training and their own experience. Um, so this uh, paper is is published in uh, Lancet uh, eClinical Medicine, um, and so you don't have to read this long and boring uh, review article. Uh, there's a simple summary for this, and essentially we have two problems. The first is a you say tomato, I say tomato problem, um, and that essentially is that the word latent TB uh, has been used, so we have the same concept, but the words being used are quite different. So latent TB has been described as MTB infection, coested infection, traditional LTBI, and so on. Uh, this isn't so bad if the reverse one also true, which is the same wording has been used to describe a totally different concept. So when you're thinking of tomato, I'm thinking of something else, maybe a potato. So latent TB could mean a positive immune response. It could mean a contained infection. It could mean a progressing infection and so on. So that's where the literature stood. And this sort of helped give us the evidence base to move to our second step, which was um, a, a Delphi sort of online, uh, a Delphi survey process. And here we invited 60 individuals. Uh, this is a mix of clinicians, researchers, policymakers, um, advocates as well. Uh, and we try to balance this in terms of uh, people from high income countries and low, low and middle income countries, gender and so on. Um, and so the part of these group, this group was recommended by the scientific organizing committee. And we did two rounds of surveys uh, using Menti. Uh, and in the first round, we were interested in sort of the broad theoretical framework and, and the research priorities. And in the second round, we did some uh, intensive sort of uh, work on the TB staging and the diagnostic criteria. And the goal of these surveys was really just to find the areas where people agree and where, where they disagree. Um, so unsurprisingly, most people thought that, uh, you know, in response to the question, is a binary, binary paradigm sufficient? Most people strongly disagreed uh, that, you know, this, this current binary, binary paradigm is, is not sufficient. Um, and most people thought, yes, it is useful to think of TB as a multi-stage disease. So, uh, so, so that was great. It was a good starting point. Um, we also had broad agreements on the TB pathogenesis and the sort of the conceptual stages. So most people agreed that this is how the disease sort of progresses. Uh, these are the different sort of concepts behind these. Uh, so, uh, for example, in this particular stage, we had some questions around whether where the MTB replicates, you agree with this definition and so on. Uh, and there was agreement here. Where there was disagreements were on, was around the specific diagnosis. So for this particular stage, is a single sputum sample sufficient? Do you need multiple sputum samples? Uh, is IGRO or TST required for diagnosis? So we didn't really have clear consensus here. Um, so that's where we were with the, with step two, and this sort of uh, was done over the over the winter, which was uh, quite quite uh, quite rough in London a, a couple of years ago. But luckily, it was time for stage three. It was an in-person symposium in in sunny Cape Town. 
Um, and so that was a welcome break for all of us who were suffering from uh, January blues here. Uh, and so after this sort of uh, uh, Delphi process, we sort of had uh, intensive talks and uh, discussions. And then we finally had a very simple kind of voting process in which you people were given post-its. And if you had the green posted, you agreed with the definition that was proposed. And if you uh, raise your uh, red posted, you disagreed. Um, so after several rounds of voting, we finally came down to this which is the conceptual framework for early TB. Uh, so here we have proposed to reclassify TB into five states um, uh, across three uh, diagnostic domains. So uh, this assumes that all states have viable MTB within the host. And then we start with, uh, and, and the three domains are macroscopic pathology, signs and symptoms, and infectiousness. And so we have, uh, we start with MTB infection, then subclinical TB non-infectious, subclinical TB infectious, uh, clinical TB non-infectious, and clinical TB infectious in which um, so, so that's essentially the the, the framework. Um, so I know what you're thinking. This is uh, a bit too simplistic, but that was the idea, which was to have a parsimonious set of uh, TB states with consistent definitions that's easy to sort of remember and replicate. And it's also easy if you're a medical student who is sort of trying to remember what all, what is the new classification for TB. Um, so the simplicity element was really key. Um, there's also a recognition within the group that at the moment, this is a research framework. So it's so it's meant to be as a guide, as a signpost to guide further research and to spur innovation in this area. So it's not ready for immediate program or policy use, uh, but there is some uh, work on that uh, that I'll be talking about later. Um, and then finally, we uh, have suggested to use the word state instead of stage, and this is to reflect that there's an undulation in the disease process. So you can move from, from uh, these different stages. So the table is better represented uh, in, in this diagram in which you start off with MTB infection, uh, and then you can progress to one of these stages and you can cycle around from uh, between these different stages uh, and then you can have have an outcome or you can go back to an MTB infection stage as well. So it's a uh, it's keeping in mind that this pathogenesis is, is dynamic and it's, you're not in, in a singular state at, at a particular point. Um, Right, so this, this framework has been published as well, as some of you uh, already know, in, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Um, we I presented this uh, at World TB Day uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we also had a symposium on this in the Union Conference. Um, and uh, we've been working with different uh, uh, professional associations in different countries. So I presented this at the Pakistan Chess Society meeting, which is a uh, sort of the Pakistan wing of the union. Um, and there's been sort of an interesting uptake and discussions on that. And obviously the framework you can just Google on as if you put in ICE TB. So that's where things currently stand. And I thought for this talk, I'll sort of update a little bit more on how we can use this framework and hopefully it'll be of benefit to people in the audience. Um, so looking at the first stage, which is sort of the MTB infection. And as I mentioned, there's challenges in, in, in diagnosis here. And at the moment, this is when this is conceived, it was sort of thought of as a conceptual uh, sort of definition in which you have a viable MTB. Uh, but there's sort of uh, ongoing research in this area. So just as, as an example, um, there's sort of three different ways in which uh, people are looking into diagnosing MTB infection. Uh, so the first is look, using CRISPR uh, to sort of directly detect MTB uh, within, within serum samples and using Actophage. Uh, and, and then finally, a, diff a different approach is looking at CD34 hematopoietic stem cells which are sort of a reservoir for latent TB. So the interesting thing about all these different technologies and tests is that they're actually pathogen-based biomarkers. So they're not checking for immune response, they're actually checking for actual uh, bacterial DNA. So this could be a future test for uh, for, M for the MTB infection stage. Now these uh, bacteria have been detected in individuals who uh, in, generally in contacts, but these individuals didn't have any symptoms. They were negative on IGRA uh, and, and, some, and they didn't have any extra abnormalities. So this sort of, fits into that definition. Uh, at the moment, they're quite laboratory heavy, so they have different processing challenges. Some of them require cryofreezing. Uh, the others need uh, 100 ml of uh, blood. Uh, but I think there's work happening in this area to sort of bring this down and make it ready for clinical use. Um, moving on to this sort of the second stage, which is the subclinical TB non-infectious. And here I'll talk a little bit about the treatment um, aspect. And uh, a lot of you at the unit will be familiar with this. Uh, this is a concept that Hanif and uh, all of us have been working for a while. It's called Radio TB. Is looking at diagnose, uh, treatment, uh, novel treatment durations for individuals who have been identified in the active case finding setting. And here we're looking at individuals with chest x-ray abnormalities, but are negative on sort of conventional uh, diagnostic tests. Um, and we rule out sort of previous TB history in, in these individuals. And then they'll be randomized to different durations of uh, this, uh, the current uh, uh, sort of six-month treatment. So we have a 
uh, active treatment group, which will receive the standard treatment. Uh, there will be a control group that will receive no treatment, uh, and individuals in the middle will be randomized for different durations. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a sort of a durations. Uh, the concept has been built by Matteo at the at the unit, and it was initially developed for cancer trials, I believe, uh, to sort of uh, reduce the durations of uh, treatments. And so we're trying to apply it here um, to optimize the duration for treatment within this uh, sort of early stage of TB. Um, uh, and this application has been submitted to Welfare. Uh, we'll hear back from them on this. Um, as a third example, looking at subclinical TB in, in infectious stage. So this is where individuals have bacteriological positivity. Um, uh, and just briefly, uh, a trial that I've sort of been working on for my PhD is looking at uh, sort of targeted screening of active case finding using artificial intelligence software. So this is guiding individuals, uh, guiding uh, screening events to places where there's potentially increased transmission as detected through AI software. So this is focusing on the subclinical uh, infectious group. And really what the framework has done is help re reorient the conversations in this area. So initially there's a lot of discussion around active case finding, uh, whether it's beneficial or not, it's very, it's very costly. But having subclinical infections as one of the sort of terms that we're using is sort of helping to differentiate uh, this type of intervention from your uh, sort of standard um, care in, 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 a, in a clinic setting. Um, and, and the protocol paper for this uh, should be out hopefully by tomorrow. Um, and, and then finally, uh, looking at uh, just as an example of uh, health policy, uh, and that sort of encompasses the entire framework. Um, so another paper that's hopefully coming out later this uh, this month in IJTLD uh, is, is work we did with uh, Justin Denham, who heads the uh, TB control program in, in Victoria, Australia. And sort of we looked at how we can apply this framework uh, in a low incident setting. Uh, and, and really the, the, the key takeaway here is that uh, they're treating potentially a lot of people with uh, latent TB using the old diagnostic definition, but with new tests and sort of focusing on the MTB infection or the subclinical TB non-infectious stage, you can sort of reduce the numbers of people that are receiving unnecessary treatment and then really focus in on, on people that, that can benefit from, from this. Um, so we're working on a revised sort of disease burden estimate for, for that particular state and then applying it to the rest of Australia. Um, in the high incidence setting, this is a little bit more tricky because you know um, uh, the, potentially the number of people that will need to be treated uh, sort of really expands. Um, and so we are working with the WHO, hopefully starting from October, in which we'll be working with different TB programs to see how this framework can be applied into programmatic use uh, and you know whether they even find it beneficial or not. Um, so as you can see, this uh, the idea here really is that this framework can be used in a variety of different sort of research domains, ranging from novel diagnostics or treatments, uh, community screening as well as sort of policy use. Um, and that's sort of sort of the basic idea. And I hope uh, you know this talk was helpful in thinking about this really interesting topic around early TB. So I really want to thank everybody who sort of uh, was involved in this activity. It was a very large group of people. And I hope all of you are also excited about early TB now as well. So thank you.